Good morning, everybody. Even though uh, people are still wandering in, we are at um, we are at our start time, and so uh, we will get started with prayer because I know <laughs> I know they roll the video. <laughs> What's that? Well, I have a whistle on my keychain, but. <laughs> I used to use it for confirmation, but it always seems a little impolite with adults, you know? <laughs> Let somebody else whistle. <laughs> um, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you with uh, thanksgiving uh, on this special week uh, of remembering so many of the ways that you have blessed us and uh, provided for us and protected us. And uh, we ask that you would help us to really begin to get a feel for how much you have done for us. And um, not just uh, in the wealth that you grant us, but uh, certainly in the spiritual blessings, uh, knowing Jesus, uh, greatest blessing ever. And uh, we ask that you would help us to be grateful people, people who enter your gates with thanksgiving. And uh, we ask your blessings on our class today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, speaking of wealth, uh, we left off on uh, the top of page 15, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And um, we are in Matthew chapter six, and Jesus says, uh, verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, you know, it really does matter to God, how we handle the wealth in uh, our lives. And it isn't like money or it, wealth or poverty is really good or evil in itself. It is our attitude toward those kind of things that is uh, that really matters. And I put down there, by the way, that uh, first reference, Second Timothy, that should read 1 Timothy. <laughs> there is no 2 Timothy chapter 6. Um, it's 1 Timothy chapter 6, and that is a significant um, portion uh, about uh, wealth. And um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, um, you know, there's just a one little phrase in there which stood out to me, and, and uh, I preached yesterday at Retirement Community, and um, and that was part of it, because I thought, I have really never noticed that. But verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then he goes on to say, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. So these are instructions for people basically who are prosperous and really just by virtue of living in America, most Americans, even though they may feel like they struggle uh, compared to so much of the world, we are prosperous. And the idea being that it's God who has granted us the wealth that we have. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, it talks about how God ultimate, ultimately is the source of all our blessings. That, um, and Moses says to the people, just remember that it's God who gives you the ability to earn wealth. Um, it isn't that God is just handing it to us, but he's given us the ability that we can go out there and uh, earn wealth for ourselves, but ultimately it comes from God. But, you know, around Thanksgiving time, we do tend to sometimes feel a little guilt. I mean, it's like we want to be able to thank God for all the good things we have, and yet there's that sense of how many people out there are homeless, how many people out there lack even 
<laughs> the basic necessities, and then we feel guilty almost even in thanking God for what we have, even though we have acknowledged that what we have comes from God. And then when I saw that, that, uh, that phrase, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And I looked up the word enjoyment in the Greek lexicon, and, it's, and it basically means to take pleasure in. And so, you know, there's that balance for us um, in having wealth to thank God, to share with others, because that is really why God grants us so much, so, so that we can provide for others and share generously, but also not to feel guilty because of his gifts, but indeed to also enjoy them for ourselves and take pleasure in them. However, when Jesus is talking here um, in the Sermon on the Mount, it really is a matter of um, what is, where is your heart? You know, is it in those kind of treasures that we have or can we simply enjoy them but realize, hey, if they're gone tomorrow, they're gone tomorrow. You know, God gives and takes away kind of attitude uh, because it's so easy with material goods to fall into greed or to covet because somebody else has a better looking house or a bigger house than you have or is able to do vacations that you cannot take. Um, selfishness becomes an issue. And I mean, those kind of things are true whether you are poverty stricken or, you know, wealthy. There's always that tendency to want more or to cover what someone else has. And so we have to be careful that our hearts, our real treasure, isn't in the material goods um, that we have. Uh, Campbell Morgan there, the quote on the page says, the thing which matters is not so much the possession of the treasure, as the effect the possession of the treasure will have on us. Uh, because possessions can possess us. They can easily become the most important things in our lives. Uh, Luther, Martin Luther said in his commentary, that earthly treasures are, are certainly not forbidden by scripture, but you can't cling to them. You know, you have to be ready to let them go. And our real treasure ought to be in heaven. And so how do we store up treasures in heaven? Um, you know, that, and that's kind of a, um, hard to say in a, in a way. Um, according to, I don't know even who said this, I just have it in my notes here, that for the Jews of Jesus' day, that, that quote, treasures in heaven, was a familiar phrase, and for them it would um, imply deeds of kindness, uh, charity, and also one's character, because basically that's what you can take with you <laughs> into heaven. Uh, the material goods are, are going to be gone. And uh, so what builds our character is building up our treasures in heaven. What we give away is uh, really uh, as if we are making that deposit uh, for treasures in heaven. Our acts of faith and love, our prayers for others, our witness, uh, everything we do for God's glory stores up treasures in heaven. And uh, what exactly is that treasure uh, <laughs> that we'll find that we've stored up when we get to heaven? Well, Jesus never defines it. And so, um, it's kind of hard to know, but Dallas Willard there, the quote says, uh, the most important commandment of the Judeo-Christian tradition is to treasure God and his realm more than anything else. Uh, to be able to see things in the light of uh, God's kingdom, uh, to be able to evaluate things in our lives uh, according to their worth to the God, kingdom of God, to their relation. Uh, to God's kingdom, um, because if that's where our treasure is, you know, if that's where our heart is, that's where our treasure is also. And uh, we will let the Lord surprise us uh, someday with uh, the kind of treasures that are ours in heaven. And he goes on to say, verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. 
And uh, I never really understood what that meant and uh, didn't find a satisfactory um, explanation until I ran across this online uh, from the Israel, Israel Bible Center teachings that they do. And uh, it said, this was an expression for the Jews of Jesus' day that meant everything in your life depends on how you see things. And that certainly would fit uh, the meaning that Jesus is talking about here. To be able to see from God's perspective, to be able to see from the perspective of eternity, um, rather than our own sinful, distorted perspective, perspective of, of things. And indeed, uh, as much as we in our own nature want to understand what's around us, we as sinful human beings tend to see things with distortions. And um, that's just the way it is. And yet um, we trust the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us see things correctly. It has to do with a single-mindedness, um, looking toward God's Word as our guiding, guiding light, uh, not being torn in two different directions by two different points of view in our allegiance, our allegiance solely to the kingdom of God, our loyalties to Jesus Christ, single-minded in that kind of a, a way. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Yes, Roy. Some what showed up? then that is going to be reflected in your life and it is going to put you into a prison. But if you see that the kingdom of heaven is all around you and going by leaps and bounds, then you will see that it's already in action right here, right now. So, you know, I think that's a clear illustration of the eye as the lamp of the body. Mm -hmm. Whatever your mindset is, you're going to determine, you're going to determine what church you go to in your faith and everything. It's going to control your whole life if your focus is all on negativity. Well, it's not here all the way. <laughs> or we wouldn't have homelessness, we wouldn't have climate change, we wouldn't have Russia invading Ukraine, you know. And somewhere in there, you're right, there has, there is a balance because as believers, you know, Jesus called Satan the, the prince of this world. And so there is a very real sense that the powers of evil are present in our world and uh, influencing um, people and nations, uh, North Korea, you know. Um, and according to the Bible, things will get to a point where it is, you know, Jesus says these, these are the beginning signs of things to come. And yet, at the same time as believers, to be able to hold to that and realize that the kingdom of God has already broken into our society and that God's spirit is, uh, you know, Muslims are turning to Jesus in great numbers. You don't hear that because they certainly aren't going to publicize it. Um, you know, there's just amazing things that God is doing and continues to do. And um, somewhere in there, it's that hope and that knowledge that indeed around us, we need to be much more aware of where we see the hand of God working and uh, uh, the Spirit of God changing things and to be able to align with those kinds of things um, rather than just the, you know, isn't it horrible? Um, and yet at the same time recognizing that, um, yeah, things are horrible <laughs> to some, you know, there is that warfare between the good and the evil. And the thing for us as Christians to remember is, is actually the war's already been won. 
the war was won on Calvary when Jesus died and then Easter rose again. Death has been defeated. Jesus said before his crucifixion, um, now the God of this world, Satan, uh, the prince of this world will be thrown out, is cast down. And, um, and so, I mean, it, it's already happened. And so what people, you know, just use that, that fic picture of, uh, well, you know what they use a lot of times is the picture of uh, World War II. Once the Allies landed in France, basically the war was going to be gone, done. Once that bomb fell in Japan, you know, the war was over. Now there were still mop-up operations and people still died, soldiers died, the battles in Europe were horrendous, but for all due purposes, that victory had now been secured. And, and, uh, and that's the way we see Calvary. We're still in a battle, but hey, we know our king has won. He's already reigning in heaven. His reign has broken into the earth. And, um, and now I'm getting way off the subject. <laughs> um, okay, a slave cannot serve two masters. And um, in, uh, that's verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or you're devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And um, of course, in the old King James, it says mammon, which uh, came to, had to, that idea of that which is trusted, but came to mean money because so many people do trust in money. But the picture Jesus uses is that of, um, it, it really is slavery. It isn't just a servant. It is the idea of, I mean, there was slavery in uh, Jesus' day. And if you were a slave, you belonged to your master, you had no, you, you could not decide for yourself how you wanted to spend your time. You had no real time of your own. Everything about you and your day belonged to uh, the person who uh, owned you. And so Jesus is saying, you know, think of it in that way. You can't serve both God and wealth. Um, you, can, you have to make your choice. And it isn't, um, you know, we got off the subject uh, in the Thursday class a little bit, uh, looking at what that means for our commitment to Christ, where he's calling for that soul allegiance to God. And, um, in, and that's why I put this on the board. Jesus never asks us to do what he himself has not done. Because in John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus is saying that um, um, verse 30, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just for I, this is Jesus, I seek not to please myself but him who sent me. And then you get to chapter 6 and he says something similar in um, verse 38, verse 38, um, for I have, Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And so, you know, when Jesus asks us to give our full allegiance to God, it isn't, you know, God is not, God doesn't want a bunch of slaves. He doesn't want to enslave us, but he does call for our allegiance. And uh, Paul calls himself a servant of God, which basically the word means slave. But it was the idea that God has done so much for us that in turn, our desire is to serve him. And so we offer ourselves to him knowing that as somewhere it says, <laughs> New Testament, we've been bought with a price, you know, the blood of Christ. We belong to him and uh, we offer that service voluntarily. But still, you know, what Jesus is calling for is that, that allegiance to God above all else. Because if you're trying in part of your life to really build up your earthly kingdom and God isn't first, um, then it's just, it's pretty much going to crumble in the end anyway. 
uh, but we do try sometimes to have it both ways, you know, um, to make sure that, you know, even we, we say God, it comes first, but I better have a plan B in case God doesn't come through for me. And um, that's, no, you know, we need to trust God to uh, uh, see us through our lives. Um, Augustine said, quoted uh, by Luther, what I love, that is my God. And, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves seriously, you know, what is my first love? Is it really the Lord or is it something else that I'm putting first in my life? And in this passage, Jesus is talking about, is it God or is it money? But he will at another place say, is it God or is it your family? You know, Jesus is always number one. Um, and he served God, his Father, that way while he was on earth, and he calls us to uh, do that as well. Uh, God as master, and uh, the fill in the blank is that, uh, what does God want me to do? Um, and that should be our question, you know, what does God want me to do? And it, it is <laughs> certainly not that we don't have our own plans and we do our, you know, have our recreations and we go about our business, but ultimately that's the question of our lives. What is God wanting me to do? And uh, because it is, he's the one we serve. Stewardship, I think, is uh, the best way to look at um, how we handle wealth. And of course, stewardship, means that we believe all that we have is entrusted to us from God and it's to be used in a way that pleases Him. And that doesn't mean you have to give it all away and we just saw in First Timothy, no, you get to enjoy it yourselves too. Um, you know, God is not, God is a loving Father and uh, we need to keep remembering that. Um, it's been said that uh, if we don't make God first in our lives, um, just being human as we are, something um, else will take its place. Uh, we will end up uh, letting, if it's not money uh, or, you know, position or even fear. You know, a lot of people live their lives ruled by fear not by choice, but, you know, if we aren't making God Lord of everything, something else will fill in that void. Okay, questions, comments? <laughs> Oh, exactly, yes, and of course, really, if money becomes the most important thing, whatever becomes the most important thing to you, other than God himself, that becomes uh, your idol. Um, and I mean, really, that can be anything, you know, it, whether it's family or job or money or, you know, who knows, popularity, just, you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> Okay, moving on to page 16, worry. Um, Jesus says, verse 25, I tell, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? And, and of course, then he goes on to talk about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Um, therefore... If you were in my uh, class on Hebrews, we talked about how every time you see a therefore, you ask, what is it there for? And uh, it seems to be based on what Jesus has just said. God is our master. He has our first allegiance. And we've chosen to follow him. Um, so therefore, we really do not need to worry about those kind of, of matters uh, because earth's treasures basically have no real hold on us. God's kingdom is our priority, so, you know, we aren't going to worry about it and we'll trust God. Um, Bonhoeffer says, don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, this is not, that that command is not to be taken as a philosophy of life or a moral law. 
It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and only those who follow him and know him can receive this word as a promise of the love of his Father. And, and you know, Jesus isn't telling us don't plan, <laughs> you know, don't be stupid, um, you know, but just don't, don't fret, don't worry, don't let it consume you that you're concerned about inflation or what if we go in recession and what happens to my pension plan and all of those kind of things. Um, um, you know, it, it is a concern and so we bring it to God, which uh, I put on the board there from Philippians uh, chapter four, a good verse to remember. Um, chapter four, verses six and seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but, since we do seem to have concerns, but in every situation, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, you take those concerns, those worries and you lay them before the Lord and he understands and we leave them there and we know that he will take care of things uh, somehow. <laughs> Maybe not always in the way with, we would like, but uh, and be, if we can do that, then indeed the peace of God will reign in our hearts uh, the, in a way that's beyond human understanding, you know. And I think we've probably all known people who, in the midst of a real crisis, seem to have a peace about them. You know, it, it, is, it defies human understanding, you know, and that's what that verse is talking about, the, the real peace of God, knowing that we can trust. So what is Jesus' argument here? Um, what is he saying in uh, that whole passage? Basically, you know, a number of things. One, he's saying that, God, that worry is unnecessary because if God is going to care for flowers and birds, then he's going to take care of us. We are more valuable than um, birds and flowers. So worry is unnecessary. Um, secondly, that um, God is our Father. And... Um, Given that God is our Father, it says, you know, then <laughs> He knows what we need and He cares about us. I mean, that's the idea of Father. Uh, when you were a little kid, you didn't worry about, um, you know, what was, will we have dinner tonight? Um, who's going to take care of me tomorrow? No, you know, you knew your parents were there. And, and Jesus says, you have God as a father, so you don't need to worry. Um, worry is useless. Uh, Jesus says, uh, verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No. So, I mean, basically, when you worry, you're not really accomplishing anything. Um, and then, Fourthly, worry shows a lack of faith, and um, Jesus talks about um, verse 32 about how the pagans run after all those things, but you don't need to because your heavenly Father knows you need them. You know, so worry, if we're worrying, we're acting like people who don't know God, and we have a we have God in our lives and we know him as our father, so we shouldn't need to worry. Um, certainly, a uh, fifth one, worry is debilitating. It robs us of our strength. And I, you know, Corey Ten Boom has that, had a quote that, about worry that um, I can't, can't seem to remember, but it was something about um, worry doesn't make tomorrow okay, it just robs today of its strength. And that, that's an extremely rough quote. Um, she said a lot better, but I just can't think of it. But it does, it, it's what we're doing is not taking care of tomorrow's problems when we worry, we're just making today uh, a mess. <laughs> we are robbing today of its strength. Um, Jesus basically says at the end there, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
a very realistic comment. <laughs> and so, yeah, you only live one day at a time, so there's no point worrying about tomorrow. Take care of today. It has enough trouble of its own. And then um, the last thing, that there is something much more important than all of those things. And Jesus says in verse 33, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then all those things will be given to you as well. You know, that comes first. Uh, live life in the light of eternity, in the light of what's really important, and um, God will take care of you. Um, What's that? Uh, five was worry is debilitating. It robs us of strength. And six was you can only live one day at a time anyway. Um, then uh, Tilaki there says, isn't it true that everything depends upon who it is who says these words about the birds and the lilies? Because Jesus is not a dreamer. He's, he's a realist. He's not some romantic kind of nature lover who just, oh, look at the flowers, look at the birds, you know. No, you know, I mean, this is somebody who is in a constant struggle for his life against the Jewish leaders who early in his ministry already decide he needs to go. Um, so, I mean, this is somebody who's a realist and yet at the same time understands the the providence of God and knowing God's love and uh, that he is involved in our lives. Um, Tilaki says, we're really listening to one whose life on earth is anything but bird-like and lily-like. Uh, on uh, the bottom of page 16, um, I've uh, included a number of quotes from Tilaki's sermon on this part of the Sermon on the Mount, and um, I'm not going to read all of them because they're right there for you to look at, but I wanted to include them because I thought his um, sermon on the subject um, is uh, just excellent. And uh, a lot of it is, is with that understanding that um, God does have a purpose. And let me just, that first one, if in the terrible things that happen, we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had a purpose in all this and that there was love in it somewhere, then we could bear everything. And of course, his point is, yes, God does have a purpose in it. And so therefore, we can trust him. We may not know that purpose, but God is in control. And keep in mind, Tilaki is preaching this sermon just a few years after, in Germany, a few years after the defeat of Germany in World War II. I mean, he, they've come through a lot. And um, so, I mean, they knew what that struggle was. But yet, thinking in terms of God's purpose, and we're going to trust Him. And, um, you know, anyway, the quotes there, I thought, are just um, really significant. Um, page 17. Moving along to chapter 7, and judging others. <laughs> um, Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Um, this is a difficult kind of passage, because it starts with, not judging others, and then it ends this particular section with verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred, do not throw your pearls to pigs. <laughs> so, <laughs> how do we know who the dogs and the pigs are? <laughs> and isn't that judging them to call somebody a, a dog or a pig? Um, you know, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a difficult sort of passage. Um, all in all, and, and obviously the, the problem really is judgmentalism. Um, you know, we have to be discerning with people, um, but when we're judgmental, when we really uh, think we know better than they do uh, about how to run their lives, uh, when we criticize something in them and feel we are much more above that kind of thing, 
um, it always carries that little bit of self-righteousness in it. Um, you know, we hear about a hardship case and think, well, I wouldn't have allowed myself to get into that position, you know. Or they should have done this, or they should have done that, and uh, so they're sort of to blame for what uh, their, their problems are. And, um, and, you know, maybe they are, but that isn't for us to say, and we're not in their shoes. And um, to come at somebody with advice in which we've mixed a sort of judgmental attitude certainly doesn't help anyone. It just stirs anger and resentment. And, um, you know, and then usually people just throw the fault finding right back at us. The thing is, we are just not qualified to judge other people. I mean, we don't know their mindset. We don't know how God is dealing with them. We don't know what they've been through in the the, in their lives. We don't know their genetic makeup. You know, we don't know any of those things. So we just are not qualified to make judgments on other people. And it doesn't have to be even um, a verbal that we're even saying it. it. It's mental. And I made this confession to the class on Thursday. And uh, just let me give it to you as an example. I am um, the coordinator for uh, LCMC pastors in Arizona, which basically means I'm in charge of getting them together for lunch once a month. <laughs> and uh, anyway, <laughs> a number of years ago, uh, when I first retired and started attending the lunches, there was a, a man who would come to most of the lunches who was, I, I judged to be quite a bit older than myself. And um, and not real healthy either. And he was a seminarian. He uh, obviously second career and was doing an internship at a, a church locally. And so he would come to the pastor's lunches. And, and then after a, a brief time of his being with us, then he got really sick. I mean, he looked pretty feeble and not well anyway. And then he got really sick, and um, he wasn't there for like well over a year and uh, seriously ill. And meanwhile, I'm making this judgment in my mind, thinking, <laughs> why is he doing this? Why is he a seminary? Why is he pursuing ordination? I mean, the man, is, he, is any church going to call him to serve? You know, unless it's a handful of people and they can't pay anybody. And so, you know, he'll take it as a sort of a charity thing. Um, so I'm making these judgments about him and thinking that surely God didn't call him to do this. Um, you know, but that's his business, you know, if that's what he wants to do. But um, I had a real sense of, of <laughs> you know, this makes no sense. And uh, anyway, um, and then of course we, you know, with the pandemic and stuff, we didn't uh, meet for over a year. And um, last spring, he came to, and some, uh, it's very possible, some of you will know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to give you his name, but uh, uh, anyway, last spring, he came to uh, one of the pastor's lunches again. And I have to say, he looked better than he ever had before. Um, he just, he, obviously his health had returned, and he announced that he had just about finished his seminary training, and so he was going to be ordained um, this summer. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> more power to you, you know. Um, and uh, in LCMC, you do not have to have a church that calls you first before they'll ordain you, which you did in the ELCA. But um, anyway, so I went to his ordination in July. I think it was July. It was in the summer. And I was totally blown away. I, <laughs> they had different people speaking about this man. He had spent a few tours of duty. I don't remember. I think it was in Iraq. Um, and uh, really did an amazing job there. Uh, he had done some work with the chaplains there, but he'd also been trained as a EMT while he was in Iraq and in, in whatever branch of the military he was in. And um, I mean, just people one after another would talk about 
what an amazing man this this is. And then, then somebody got up and said that on one of the Crucio weekends that this man attended, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's like you go on a Thursday night and it goes through Sunday night and it's um, yeah, a spiritual renewal kind of thing. So he is on the weekend and somebody goes into cardiac arrest and he saves the man, you know, because he's a trained EMT. And of course they got the ambulance there, but not, it wouldn't have been in time, but this guy literally saved the man's life. And he was there at the ordination, the man whose life he saved. And I'm just sitting there thinking, whoa. And then it turns out, I mean, the man wasn't pursuing going into church ministry. He wanted to be a hospital chaplain. And in fact, he's doing a residency in hospital chaplaincy now in uh, Yuma, Arizona. And I, you know, and it's like, I'm telling myself, or maybe the Holy Spirit is, how dare you make a judgment about God's call on somebody's life? How dare you do that? You know, you, you know nothing. <laughs> and and I, I just, I thought, whoa, you know? And, and fortunately, of course, I never had voiced my feelings about that to anybody. And for all I know, some of the other pastors sitting around the table were thinking the same thing. Uh, but here is this remarkable man and, um, and now pursuing his dream of chaplaincy, you know? And um, I mean, if I had been on some sort of board that had to approve him, I probably, well, maybe then I would have gotten to know him better, you know, but... But, you know, it just, you can't judge other people. I mean, you just, you can't. And uh, we tend to, but we really, we should not. We are always, always on shaky ground if we are making inner conclusions about people that um, we have no right to make. Um, the real question to ask ourselves, are, will we treat people with grace or with judgment? Um, and even if our appraisal of someone is correct, you know, if you're thinking that person is a real jerk, <laughs> and he really is, uh, but judgment is left to God because we just don't know. Um, you know, and, and how dare we expect that God treat us with grace if we're not going to extend that grace to other people. Um, because really, all in all said, um, we only deserve God's judgment on our own lives, and yet he treats us with, with uh, grace. Um, not judging others, however, about a third of the way down on your sheet there, it does not mean that, oh, we just let criminals go free. <laughs> no, obviously not. Um, and when a, an action is clearly wrong, well, we speak up. We don't just let people get away with doing things that are totally wrong. Um, not judging does not mean that we don't use discernment in a situation uh, to assess a, a situation or a person's behavior. Uh, it doesn't mean allowing people to act irresponsibly. So, I mean, you know, as in all of the Sermon on the Mount, there is that balance. You know, it isn't a set law. It's you look at the situation and, and always letting love, grace be the guiding factor. But, you know, you don't, you just don't let people, well, you know. <laughs> um, Stott says the command not to judge others uh, is not a requirement to be blind, but rather it's a plea to be generous with people, generous with people. Um, a basic requirement that Jesus makes if uh, <laughs> you're going to correct other people is that uh, you get rid of the log in your own eye first before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And, um, and that basically means, you know, you see ourselves as we are and criticizing ourselves, first of all. Um, when I did clinical pastoral education, which was required of all seminarians, it meant you spent 10 weeks in a hospital, usually hospital setting, um, and under the direction of a psychologist. And so you're in a small group, and my particular group um, spent more time in therapy than we did on the hospital floor being chaplains, but that was just 
because of my particular leader. Anyway, um, this psychologist, uh, it was his firm conviction, and I guess this is sort of a psychological principle. I never took a lot of psychology, but what you criticize in someone else is really what is true of you. And I used to argue that with him because I just did not believe that. But um, I'll let you decide for yourselves whether you think it's true or not. But it, uh, often it is the case that what really grates on us about somebody else is sometimes closer to our own behavior than uh, we like to admit. Um, I don't know. Bonhoeffer said that if in judging others, it is our aim to destroy evil, then we better start with our own hearts because <laughs> there's evil there too. And uh, anyway, we need to, um, I, you know, the more mature we are, um, the more we realize how much we need God's grace. And when we begin to realize how much we need God's grace, then um, we tend to extend it more to other people as well. Um, within the church family, as far as judgment, uh, Matthew 18, 15 deals with how one does deal with um, correcting errors in the church, dealing with people. And um, Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen, you've won them over. If they won't listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse, tell it to the church, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so there is a, a, a way that uh, we are to deal with people who are in error. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently gently, <laughs> but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And so, you know, there is that place for how do you deal with a wrong? And I know there's one of the LCMC churches uh, in Arizona that recently had a case where um, they, they did. They, they, the church council sent a letter to one of the members because that member had been very divisive within the congregation and they asked that person to report to the uh, church council um, in a certain amount of time. And I have no idea what had happened with that. But, uh, you know, there are those times when you do act and you have a concern for the welfare of, of the, the church. Um, yeah, but it's always gently, always in love, always in grace, um, and without the we-them attitudes that we find today. You know, today it's so much our side, their side, um, cancel culture, you know. We just X people out and pretend as if they didn't even exist anymore if there's something about them what, that uh, displeases us. Um, People are shamed online, online shaming. Um, people are so easily offended nowadays. You know, it, I mean, university settings nowadays are impossible. I cannot imagine being a professor when practically anything you say is going to alienate or offend someone. And, and I mean, that was true when any of us were in school too, but you didn't immediately, you know, I'm offended and I, I want you to, say you're sorry, I want a public apology, I don't want anything ever said about this again. Uh, you know, it's just, a, it's just a whole different world. And uh, it is so much, uh, you know. And I thought this comment of Dallas Willard was really good. Today, the old phrase, hate the sin and love the sinner. And I mean, that was, <laughs> that's been, that been around forever. You know, and uh, we look at Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, and they want uh, him to go ahead and let them stone her. And, uh, and of course, he says, he that is without sin, cast the first stone, and they all leave. 
And then he says to her, go and sin no more. You know, it's that love for her and the hate of the sin. And um, anyway, Dallas Willard says, today that old phrase, hate the sin and love the sinner, is no longer accepted. If you disapprove of what I do or how I do it, it is now generally thought you can only be condemning me and rejecting me. And then he gives an example, quote, I am my actions, it is thought. And how then can you say you disapprove of my actions, but love me? And, um, and that's difficult because, um, you know, Christians have for a long time felt like, yes, we don't approve of this person's actions and their, their way, their lifestyle, and it's contrary to scripture, but I can still love that person and extend grace to that person now, as a person for whom Jesus died, uh, maybe as a fellow believer in Jesus. And, and yet here, what he's saying, and I think it's very true, is that our love is no longer accepted. It's now rejected because if you're not going to approve my lifestyle, then you don't love me. And, and we see that in families, you know, where parents are dealing with kids who are off on their own and into whatever, um, you know, feeling like drugs is an okay lifestyle for them, as long as they're not harming anybody else. You know, that's always the sort of issue. And, uh, and, and parents try to love, and yet it's like, I'm sorry, you know, if you can't accept my lifestyle, if you can't accept the way I live and the choices I make, well, then you don't love me. And, um, and I'm not sure how we overcome that other than continuing to love the person and do what we can for them and serve them as Jesus serves. Um, I don't know. Um, comments? Yes. Yep. Yep. And you know, we can love and still, I mean, if people reject our love, well, that's it. But, um, you know, still, we still love. We don't take it away. It's Cheryl? To, um, have a relationship with <laughs> well, you know, and that is true. It's uh, it's um, now almost you you fear to say anything uh, to anybody. And uh, I'm trying to think of what it was that I said, and and it was actually at one of the pastors' luncheons. And uh, oh, I think it had to do with Black Lives Matter. And, and I was not saying, hey, everybody get a sign and we're going out there to march, you know, with these signs that say Black Lives Matter. But I made the comment that, because um, we were all white in the, the lunch, and I said, um, you know, we really need to hear what people are saying and the hurts that this movement is, is um, expressing for people who've had an experience in life that we are unfamiliar with, I mean, we didn't grow up black. And uh, so I said, it, it, we really need to pay attention to, you know, what exactly is this movement saying? And one of the other pastors, two of them, jumped all over me. And don't you know, that's a communist organization, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, you know, yeah, maybe it does have communists in it. I don't know. I don't know that much about it. But still, you know, you're talking about people's lives. And, and, and one of the other pastors said, well, that may be, but the average person, the black person who is supporting that is not a communist. They're doing it because they are hurting and they have experienced a lot of discrimination in their lives. And um, anyway, the other pastor didn't buy it, but you know, I thought that's, that is true. You know, so it is, it is hard to know what one can say anymore. Bill?
Yeah. 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 But it's, it is hard now to engage in conversations when so many things, even this, you know, I, like you, you know, did you get your booster shot for COVID? Are you kidding? I would never, you know. <laughs> right. Say that again. The offense to the other person has been trying to take control. Hmm. It's like a matter of controlling them or, you know, manipulating Yeah. I, I can say I don't agree with that without making them feel like I'm trying to, you've got to change your thinking and you think like that. Control it. I, you know, and that is true, and we have to certainly be careful of that, too. I, I You know, um, many of us, uh, we just learn from childhood on how to manipulate people, and, and uh, we do that sometimes without really even meaning to, um, but sometimes what we do is manipulative. Um, what is it that separates the Christian from the world? And we have to remember that. It isn't that we're so much holier than other people, uh, that we, oh, it's our standard of righteous living. No, you know, the thing that separates us from the world is Jesus Christ. And it's his, um, it's his righteousness that becomes ours. Uh, it's our relationship with him that is changing us and transforming us. We are not wonderful people in ourselves. We are not, uh, you know, the cream of society. Uh, Jesus is making us the light of the world. He is making us salt of the earth, but it isn't us. And uh, so we extend that fellowship and grace to other people because they're like us. We're all sinners, you know. Romans says that uh, God loved us while we were still sinners, you know, and so we certainly can extend that love to others and not wait till they become good people. Um, I uh, took a class in, for my doctor ministry in recovery ministries um, and uh, the one professor who had become a psychologist um, uh, started his career as a pastor, as an associate pastor, and um, he had what he called <laughs> a Ken and Barbie congregation, <laughs> you know, as Barbie doll and Ken. And he says, because you could be up in front of the congregation and look out and all these beautiful people, you know, and uh, they're happy, they're well-dressed, um, uh, you know, they have their smile on their face. And yet, as a pastor, knowing that that person over there is dealing with alcoholism, that person over there has a child that's gone off the deep end. This couple is struggling in their marriage, but they all sat there very perfect. And uh, anyway, he said he um, had a, a woman come to him for counseling and a young woman, um, very little money, so she didn't dress um, nicely, um, you know, very poor clothes. and. Um, and she was struggling with addiction, but she was getting help. She was getting there. She was in recovery. And he, she made the comment to him that caused him to leave the ministry and go into psychology and counseling. And that was, Pastor, I hope someday I am good enough to be able to come to this church. You know, uh, and he was just blown away. You know, it never occurred to him that anyone would think that they had to dress a certain way or, you know, have their life so together before they would feel comfortable worshiping at that church. And, um, and, and that just changed his whole uh, mindset on ministry. Uh, because, you know, I mean, the church is a place for sinners to come, for people who are needing to uh, come into the grace of God and to know the power of God to change lives. It isn't the place you go once your life is all together. It's you, where you go when your life is falling apart and you realize it, you know. 
Anyway, we have one minute left, so we will stop there. We have one session to go, and I think we are uh, fine with uh, getting through it next time. We should be able to make, make it okay. Uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sermon, and uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit would bless its truths to our lives. So we ask that you do help us to see people more the way Jesus sees them than the way we sometimes do. Take, us, take that judgmental attitude away from us. Help us to be discerning and yet loving, uh, to truly be able to extend love to those uh, even with whom we disagree. And uh, we ask uh, that in the name of Jesus, amen.